thanks so much for joining our talk. There are many great talks to attend today, so um, we feel honored by having you guys here. Um, or sorry, I had a problem with uh, Wi-Fi, so we're starting a bit late. Um, I'm Conrad. I'm Mauro. We are software engineers from a company called Nubank. Uh, we are a technological company providing financial services. We got uh, works of with all kinds of modern cool technologies. We use functional programming, machine learning, logic programming, etc. And our talk today is immutable data architecture with the atomic Spark and Kafka. So the goal is to share our experience working as engineers in the data science team, building data architecture mostly for two purposes, to help support machine learning happening, so uh, modelers putting models in production and using them, and also creating models, and also data access, so people from different parts of the company using data. And uh, we have organized it in four parts. Background, in which you give an overview of our architecture, uh, we show the, the, a bit about the technologies that you need to understand for the rest of the talk. Then we talk about scoring, mm -hmm. which is basically you have a, a model and how do you use that f uh, to, to make a prediction. Then training, how do you build this model in the first place. And finally, analyzing how do you get data in uh, the company, how do you use it, how do you share it. So let's start with the background. We use a microservice-oriented architecture. So we have many microservices. And we are a finance, a finance company. So you'd expect that our microservices are like customers, accounts, uh, transactions, geolocation, uh, purchases, etc. And each microservice uh, owns its own database. Each microservice owns, owns its own data. Uh, the, the logic to modify uh, the data that it owns, and they communicate with each other using HTTP, but also uh, asynchronously using queues on Kafka. We have lots of queues for everything. They, uh, they have usually a, an event semantics, which we'll show. So here is an example of interaction of three services uh, in the bottom. In the orange service, you can imagine it like as a low-level financial processor uh, service uh, which can publish a message to a queue saying, okay, uh, this, this guy X has a new uh, entity Y. And then another service uh, reads that and say, okay, it's a, it's a transaction, I'm going to store it, and I'm going to notify that there is a new transaction around for whoever is interested. And then and, uh, finally, there is a, no a notification service that says, okay, there's a new transaction, and the guy wants to be uh, communicated of that, so let's send him uh, a push notification. And you can see that I've, I've uh, dotted the arrows because they are not uh, direct connections. Uh, each service here is just sending a message to, to a queue, just adding an item in, in a queue, and that queue gets uh, read by the, other, by the other service. And another important distinction uh, for our uh, architecture is that we uh, is our database. You're not using a regular database, uh, a regular uh, SQL relational database, not also a standard NoSQL database, a schema less. We're using the Atomic, which is a different uh, thing. We are a bit constrained in time here, but we'll give a small review that will allow us to understand uh, our solution. So I usually like to think of uh, uh, regular relational databases as boards. So here we have a very uh, simple example. We've got a uh, guy uh, named Quercus, job philosopher, city Sao Paulo. So we've got all this information about this guy. And okay, uh, it's in a particular state, well, but what happens when the, guy's, the guy moves around? For example, he moves around to Richmond. You have to erase the old value to make room for the new one. And in general, working with databases like this, you, you get uh, the, the feeling that's an object you have to deal with. The data is, is far away from you. By contrast, in the atomic, the, the database can be seen as just piles of facts. So here for the same example, we have uh, one pile with name, Quercus, one pile with job, philosopher, and one with the city, Sao Paulo. 
And the atomic also adds a new dimension. Uh, the t equals one in the bottom left is the, the transaction in which these facts were inserted. It can also be seen as the logical time, so it gives us ordering. And what happens when, when the Quirkus moves to another city? So a new fact is inserted with the new city. It, it happens in, tra in transaction ID number two, so it's an, in another instant. And, and as you can see, we have the, the new value and st we still have the old value. So how can you tell what is current in the, this database? Just look from above. So the, the current name is Quercus, the current job is Philosopher, and the current city is Richmond. And how is that stored in the database? It's stored as a sequence of facts. So here we have all those four facts we had in the previous screen. They, and, and each fact is an EAVT tuple. So it's an entity ID, an attribute, a value, and a transaction ID. They all have, in, in this example, they all have 1,000 as the entity ID because they all refer to the same person. The attribute, all attributes start with a person slash. This is just a convention to, to show that they are all refer to a person. So, and the third column, we have the values. And in the fourth column, we have one for the first three facts because they were inserted as, at the same time and two for the other fact. And how is it queried? We, uh, the query is just a, a, a structure with three clauses, find, in, and where. In find, you, you have the, the output, what you want to get back from the query. In in, you have the, the input, and the where clause, you have a, a series of, of constraints to link from the input to the output. So in this case, we have as an input the name, and you want to see the job of that person. And P in both clauses, in both constraints, uh, means the same, the same person. Since it's a logic query language, uh, we can keep the same constraints and change uh, the input with the output and it's still a valid query. So if we had the job and we wanted to know all persons with that job, we can just uh, exchange in, in with find. We could even, uh, we could even not have the, the input and the database would return all pairs with name and job for all persons in the, in the, that are stored there. Now let's talk about scoring. So we have lots of data in the company and we want to make predictions about future data. The artifacts that programmatically do this in, in machine, machine learning are called models. We deal with models in two stages, training and scoring. Training consists of getting, consists in getting a, a series of, of data points, x0, x, x1, until xm, and, uh, and then a, um, a modeler, a data scientist, creates a, a black box using machine learning algorithms during the train phase. And then when the model is in production, it, we use the black, uh, the black box with a new data point, x, to give a score, a, pre a prediction. It, Notice that x0, x1, and the x in black, the black box must be in the same format, the, the same attributes. So for now, let's talk about specifically scoring. So how do we get x? How do we get the uh, datum that we want to score? Remember that it must be uh, at the right time and must, be, must have the right format. So one thing we can look at is our production environment. Can't we use it somehow? Oh, we have this, uh, lots of microservices, and we have these queues. And the queues often have uh, event semantics. And they contain information about the entity that's carried around. For example, we have, uh, have a, a topic called new purchase uh, that contains, uh, the, uh, that, that is triggered when there is a, a new purchase happening. Uh, so we want to, if you want to do a, a later analysis on that purchase to see if that could be part of some fraudulent analysis, you could use that as a, 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 as a trigger 
to start the, the processing. And you can also uh, use the information contained in the topic. In the new purchase, you likely contain uh, information about the purchase. So we created a, a first approach based on that. So we, have, we created a new service there uh, using a, a queue that it's already, worked in, uh, already works in production. And this new service contains the models that we want to run. So it con con consumes from the queues and reads its content. However, this information is often not enough. For example, if you want to analyze, and the example we gave, if you want to analyze if the, the purchase is fraudulent, you wouldn't want only the information about the purchase, but about the merchant, about the, the past of the, the customer, about the location where the purchase was made. So you would need to query APIs from other services to enrich your data and then uh, pass it through the black box. And this has several downsides. For example, it affects production. So you're, you're essentially querying uh, for using features uh, that are used in production for this other thing that you're doing, this analysis that you're doing. You are adding complexity on the service. So we have to maintain uh, the, the endpoints to do these queries or create generic libraries to have generic endpoints. Uh, uh, and also, if one service goes down, it affects the other. And also traceability. It's, it's hard to, to figure out why a service, uh, a, a model give a, an output that you find suspicious if, if you don't have the input, for example, if you don't have a, a, a version of the model that was run. And often the output is uh, something simple like true or false, and the input is a lot of data. For, for the example we gave, uh, the, the purchase, the merchant information, maybe a list of purchases. So we'd have to store all of that. So we tried a second approach, which is querying data directly from the database. So to, to illustrate it, uh, let's go back to our example. Uh, we have the, the guy here, Quercus Philosopher Richmond, and let's add another effect to make it more uh, fun. Let's decide that the T3, he has a life crisis and decides to become an astronaut. So uh, what happened here? We just added a new fact there. And uh, how can we describe what's happening here? We can see that uh, right now at T3, Quercus uh, is an astronaut that uh, lives in Richmond. But can we get that def definition better? We can just keep that right, uh, skip that right now and say that, say that at T3, Quercus is an astronaut that lives in Richmond. And the same thing applies for t equals two or for any t. You can just uh, grab, a, put a cursor in a certain transaction uh, ID, and you can you can get a snapshot of that of that database at that time. It's a valid database. You can query the database. You can use it as any other database. And what and what is interesting is that if you have the ID, if you have uh, if you know that you're querying only information about query, because and you and if you have uh, the, this cursor, you don't, you don't need really to, to use the information that comes from the queue uh, to, to process anything. You can, all, uh, can use only the cursor and the ID and get all the information that you need. But it's not that simple because there are multiple DBs. So you cannot just use a, a, a transaction ID as the the current point in time to get the, the value of the database. So for example, in, in a similar time frame, we have three transactions in the left database and four transactions in the right database. So how can we do with that? Can, we cannot use the same transaction ID, so we would need one transaction ID for each database. But there, there is one simplification we can make. So instead of using the transaction, ID, we use a timestamp. This might be problematic for some cases, but in our do domain, it, it seems to be, it, it's, it's fine. So we use a, a timestamp to get the as of value of all, across all DBs. So we, we unify them all. Now let's talk about scoring. So we built a, a service for scoring, which suits our, our approach. 
So we need a service where all the data is available, where all services become one, where all the chaos intertwines. It's a, a dark land, that's why we called it Mordor. <laughs> it's a read-only current service. It, it does not interfere with prod, so it turned out not being so complicated as we first thought, so the name is more of a joke now. And what do we mean by no interference? Instead of calling an, H an H HTTP endpoint in each service, it, it simp simply uh, consumes a, a queue. So the, the red arrows are the, the endpoint calls. So now we have this, so the, the black and yellow circle is the, the, the query, the, the model service, and the red circle is the query service so the model service consumes from the same queue that the services consume and uses the query service. So we don't have a central query server that would be a bottleneck. We simply have piles of data stored in a storage device. So as long as that storage is scalable, which is the case of DynamoDB, that our solution is also scalable. So the querying services do not compete uh, with prod for resources. We, we can scale them horizontally. Now, let's talk about using this uh, architecture. So we have three parts. We have the queues. We have the black ball with the yellow dots, which is the model service. And we have the red uh, ball with the volcanoes, which is the querying service. And how can we use this tree? First, let's start with the queues. So a, a simple message comes. For example, new, new purchase. It comes, it has an ID, it has a, a merchant, it has a purchase date, it has lots of, has lots of things. And it, it also has uh, meta information. Uh, most importantly, timestamp, which means uh, what, uh, what time can we be sure that this information will be there in the database. And what we do is throw that, all that information in a way, except for the ID and the timestamp, which are the things that we need to get the data from the database. So we use uh, this information to, do, to query our uh, querying service. So this is another example of a, of a query. And the first two lines, you can see that there is an as-of, which, which we use to filter uh, all, all facts that come after and, and essentially freeze the database. We used, uh, there's port eight, which, which was the ID in the previous light. It's the ID that we, we also use. And then there's the query. I want to go really deep in, in the query. It's, simple, it's a simple query, but uh, you can notice that there uh, in the where clause, it starts with a dollar sign in all the first uh, tokens. Per, per, cus, cus, per, per. So this, what are these? These are just databases. Uh, so uh, you see that in the same query, we are just accessing uh, transparently different databases, different data sources. And now let's talk how that all that combines. So this is the model service. In the left, you can see queues. In the middle, you can see the service. And in the right, you can see the querying service. So in the left, there, there are many queues, purchases, push token notification, payments, etc., up to model output, uh, of which we'll talk later. But our, our model uh, is interested only in purchases. So uh, it, it, it subscribes to this purchases topic and then says, uh, here's how you're going to get an ID, which is a, a cursor to get. And then uh, when a new message comes, it gets it, uh, that ID and also a timestamp. And with that uh, ID, it makes a query, like the one we done uh, before, and gets an output. That output with some processing which can happen there, is the x that we are looking for in the, in the first place. We get an x, we pass to the black box, we get an output, and then we combine the output, the input, and meta information, and publish this into uh, another queue, which is the model output queue. So what does this model output queue contain? It contains these three parts, input, output, and meta. Input is just the ID we got from the queue. 
timestamp is just the timestamp uh, we got also from there, but it means that uh, it's available in the database. And the trigger, which is the, uh, for, for, the, for the queues, it's the queue name. We've got the output that the model gave, for example, true or false. And you have meta information. For example, the model, which model uh, produced this, this score, which uh, version was it running. Uh, this, this version is a git hash. Uh, and also the response time of the response. So why it's, is this useful? This is very useful for traceability. Because like I said, things go wrong and you want to figure out why your model uh, outputted some uh, early response. So what you, what you could do is take a look at, uh, grab, uh, grab that, that this information of the model run that fits in a database that we store back in the database. Uh, we query for that. We get the ID, we get the timestamp, try to reproduce the situation using the same queries or uh, uh, just a small uh, alteration of the queries used to score them and understand what's this, this information about. And if that is, even that doesn't help, you can uh, simply uh, revert uh, to, a, to the commit uh, that, uh, that uh, was used to produce that output and then pass the same input, it will access the database, which the, uh, doesn't change because it has a cursor, and it, it should produce the same output. So now let's talk about training. So going back to the other slide, we, had, we showed that uh, the model has the training phase and the scoring phase. We, we just talked about the scoring phase, now let's talk, talk about training. So at scoring time, the modeling service has, uh, has a, an ID, a timestamp, and a query, and gives all of those to the querying service. And it gets a, a piece of data in a certain format. In training time, the same thing happens. But instead of the modeling service in production, uh, a modeler, a data scientist, uses the, the same querying service. So we, we use the exact same query that we would use in prod. So the same interaction, the same code path, which avoids uh, lots of, of problems. So in other architectures, uh, sometimes you cannot do this. You, you have two different code paths, or, uh, or you use two different uh, data sources for, for training and scoring. So this is an advantage. And uh, but for training specifically, we query a lot of data at a time. So we can use a bunch of, of, of querying services in parallel. This solves the problem of getting all the data, but it doesn't solve the problem of, of fitting all that data in the memory of one single machine. And, and we also want to fit all, all derived uh, data in, in, in one single machine, because the modeler will get the raw data from the database and will produce, calculate more, more data. And the solution we choose for dealing with data uh, is using Apache Spark. Apache Spark is a large-scale data processing uh, framework. Uh, it, it's high performance and it's easy to use. And the point is that you have a Spark cluster and you can use it for your processing and for holding data. So here is the, 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 base, uh, the base object which we'll talk about is the RDD. Uh, it's resilient distributed data set. So it's, it's like a, a big data uh, collection distributed among several services. So we can fit data that doesn't depend, that doesn't fit in your memory, for example. Uh, it's also immutable. So uh, you, you, you can change it. Uh, when, you try, uh, when you change, you change through map, reduce these operations that actually produce another RDD. So here's an, exa uh, an example of this happening. We start with an, an RDD uh, of objects uh, with attributes x and y, and then we map uh, at using a function that multiplies x by y, and then what do you get? We get another RDD. And then we just uh, do a reduce and get finally a value. And what's, what's our use case? Um, we have we have all those, those datums that we need to, uh, to, to uh, you need for training, 
and they have their own properties, ID, amount, etc. That depends obviously on the model. And we want to get all that into an RDD and then uh, derive other RDDs that are more convenient to apply uh, machine learning models and then just produce that black box after using the models. And how do we do that? Just uh, basically by slicing our, our whole data into n slices. We estimate the size of the database we're, we're trying to get and uh, divide by uh, about the, uh, how, how much, uh, how, uh, how large are the, uh, the executors that we have in Spark, which are like uh, small machines you have available. And you take your, uh, and then you, you end up with a number and you just say, okay, uh, you create an RDD with this information. I have, uh, I want the n slices and this is slice one. I have n slices, this is slice two and so on. And then you map that RDD into an RDD containing the data itself of uh, those slices. But how, how is it possible to do this using our architecture? So let's take a closer look at how to shard queries. So our strategy uh, is we start with a regular query. We, cho we choose a base entity and we, we filter the rest of the query by using the, the modular operation. So if we have a, a, a simple query here that returns all pairs of purchase amounts and the bill amount of, of each purchase. So this is the, the starting query. How do we shard it? We simply insert those three lines with the arrows. So we insert the arguments, the, the parameters in, in and the, the mod operation. So now we have a shard index and a shard count in the query. The shard count will be the same for all machines, and the shard index will, will change from one machine to the other. So, in the, uh, so suppose we have, in, the, in that example, 35 machines running this query. So we use 0, 35 for the machine number 0, 135 for machine number 1, and so on, and, until 34, 35. And the, the mod, module operation uh, acts on the purchase entity. So we get the entity ID, we calculate module 35. If it's zero, we proceed with the rest of the query, which could be arbitrarily complex with function calls and so on. And if it's, if it's not zero, we, we, if it's zero, we, we proceed. If it's not zero, we discard the rest of the query. So effectively, each machine processes only one over 35 of the, the total data set. Now let's talk about something else. That's something that's unrelated to modeling, but uh, also is about data, uh, which is data access. So in any modern company, people use data. People need data to work, and that pretty much doesn't depend on what's your role, what's your job. Engineers need it, uh, analysts need it, uh, modelers, of course. And in our company, we're divided in small teams. And there is, there is a tendency uh, in, 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 uh, for, for everybody to create their own, their own ways, their own data, how, their own dumps, their own uh, functions to deal with this data, their own code paths. And something we can do to avoid this uh, is making them all use our, uh, our querying service. So an, uh, an approach uh, we, we had is to, uh, to uh, try to make everybody uh, learn our, uh, the, our querying language, use our querying uh, service. They would get fresh up-to-date data all the time. They wouldn't get dumps that need to be re, uh, refreshed and so on. And they even would, uh, could use even up-to-date uh, fun uh, uh, functions. They, uh, they sometimes have to, uh, in instead of having to rewrite something that's in, in our code base, maybe they can e even use that. So uh, the best of all, in a way that would allow them to, to not even write if they don't know how to write. 
because the problem is uh, that our query language is very powerful. It's not impossible to, to learn. People from all backgrounds have learned, people, uh, people uh, designers, uh, people working in, in finance, et cetera. They have all learned, but there's a higher barrier of entry than you would uh, expect. So our approach is, was to improve that high barrier of learn, of entry. And what it did was uh, improving the experience of doing queries through saved queries. So I, I said we have uh, lots of uh, teams, but they are also cross-functional. So there is usually one person who's an engineer, who's the, the, a data scientist, who's, who's somehow more data, more uh, tech savvy, and who knows how to use data log, how to make queries. Um, because we use this in our daily jobs, this, this querying mechanism. And so what we do is ask them to create and save this query so other people in their teams can use it. And so other people uh, uh, initially just click to run these queries and then they start to modify, modify the parameters, uh, and, and eventually, uh, little by little, learning that log until uh, someday they really want to get something done and they l uh, do a big leap and, and learn it. And it's also interesting that this approach allows them to, to save not only what I'm calling here procedures, which are like, uh, imagine a query that gets all people who are late. Uh, if they run it now and run it later to give different results. But what if they set a cursor like we've done with our analysis? They are effectively, effectively sharing data. So instead of uh, sharing lists of IDs of people in certain condition, they can, uh, people can just share uh, the squares. The squares will never change. And uh, there's a UI for that. It's, it's more beautiful. This is just my artistic re rendering. Uh, basically, we have this, all, all the squares the person can click, can see, can run, can change the parameters, and in this way, interact uh, with, the, with our data without having necessarily to program or even uh, know querying so deeply. And how are we, how are you going th with this approach? So it, it turns out everybody is using our, our service in, in, inside the company, so all teams use them. We have more than one million ex executions, hundreds, uh, almost all teams have thousands of query runs, and we have also hundreds of saved queries that, uh, that the teams consider useful for, for later usage. One also, uh, another nice thing to have is uh, start procedures. So we have three kinds of start procedures, and uh, we have one example here for each one. So we have for example, generic uh, generic function like random number generator. So, so if we want to do some uh, some test, some in market test with with, a, with some customers, we want to use the random number function to to filter them and, and to to classify who who get who is part of the test or not. We also have uh, an interest uh, function to calculate interest. It, it, it could be in a, in, a, in a central a common library that all services use. So the querying service can also take advantage of that without us having to re-implement. And we have a, a query to see if, there's, if, the, if a given person is late with, the, with, the, with their payment or not. And it's stored in the database itself. So there are three ways of doing it. And we also got some testimonials from users in, in our company. Uh, one, one business analyst uh, says uh, she, she likes it because it helps her take snapshots of the data and see how it evolves over time. All engineers like it because they can, they can see how, how the, the database ended up in, in a certain way. They can debug corner cases. It's really useful. And that analysts like it like before, like the service, because they can see they can do their analysis, get to some results, and just a few minutes before a, a meeting, they can rerun the query and the analysis and get up-to-date results because, because we, they, we don't use the a dump of the data. Now for some final remarks. What we have done, we have created a solution for scoring composed of reading cues in, uh, from production uh, using a model service 
that queries to a query, uses a querying service to get the data that does interfere with production. Also for training, what you have is using the same code path that's used in, in training to make sure you're getting the same data, make sure you're using the same queries, and also being able to scale that by uh, using Apache, uh, Apache Spark. And we also provide a solution for data access, which is basically uh, providing uh, our querying service for everybody and making sure they can learn it. And just as important, as important as what we have done is what we did not have to do by using this approach. We did not have to copy data around because the, the data is always up to date. Everybody always uses the, the central database that services use. We did not have to duplicate functions and logic. All, all functions in, in all services can be used inside the queries. We did not have to create different views for different teams. So there is one central, central source of truth. And that's what we want to show you. Uh, thank you. If you have got any questions.